AP US History Video 52 Expansion, Sectionalism, and the Civil War. Hi, I'm John Linnebal, and this is John Linnebal Tutoring, and this is my video, as I've just said, about Expansion, Sectionalism, and the Civil War. If you like what you heard and saw in this video, please, please, please click that subscribe button, please click the like button, and please leave a comment. Let's move on. Sectional divisions deepen, 1840s to the 1850s. You can take a look at the earlier video, number 41, about sectionalism. Basically, sectionalism was about the differences, both economic and demographic, between the people of the North and the South, and differences, of course, that happen because of the underpinnings of these different economies. You know, industrial economies are different from agricultural economies and slavery of course was a huge 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 linchpin in this divide it was yeah, to use a mixed metaphor sorry about that anyway slavery it was a really really big wedge that uh, you know eventually drove these states apart slavery's being allowed or not in the new territories made the problem worse it increased the tensions so as we can see here, the Missouri Compromise, we can see we had the red slave states and the blue non-slave states, free states, and we can see Missouri was introduced to the Union or entered the Union as a slave state and Maine entered as a free state. Now we look at the states and territories of the United States of America in March, from, well, from March 3rd to 1849 to September 9th, 1850. Basically, we can see here that we have all these orange states. Those are all free states. Then the purple states, those are all slave states. And then all these green territories, those are territories that hadn't really been organized into actual states yet. They were just territories. And so that was obviously going to cause problems when these states actually did form. Would they become free states or slave states? And we can see at this last map here, we can see, okay, California and Oregon were introduced as free states. And then we had these other things that were kind of territories still and then you had these orange states that would be slave states and these would be free states and this was the Crittenden's compromise thing here going on which never actually ended up happening but we can see there were a lot of things proposed in these places that would split the free states and slave states in many different ways. So let's move on. Economic differences between the North and the South. The Northern and Southern economies were different. The North was mostly industrial. It was becoming more and more industrial anyway and mostly, well, really all, was free labor there. So, you know, you were free people involved in labor, but notice that free labor did not mean that things like child labor, etc., were prohibited. In fact, they were widely used in industrial economies in the South. In the South, you, of course, had slave laborers mostly agricultural who would you know worked on plantations etc in the south so the northern population grew faster than the southern population for different reasons which of course led to more problems because then the southern population had considerably less clout in the house of representatives which was based on population than the north did because the north had a bigger population Abolitionist strategies and tactics in the 1850s. Abolitionism became more audible and visible in the 1850s. Abolitionists worked to develop effective strategies and tactics. 
Some use written and oral speeches and arguments to win audiences, such as abolitionist Harriet Tubman. She would did well, she did those things. She basically gave speeches, made arguments, etc. Others helped slaves escape. The Underground Railroad was, of course, a passage by with by which, I should say, many slaves could go to Canada and other places where they would not be enslaved. A small minority of people who were involved in abolitionism used violence. Just like today, that was not very popular and it was used by the real zealots who just really felt it was the only way to get what they wanted to get and what they believed was morally necessary. Fugitive Slave Act versus Personal Liberty Laws Many Northerners didn't like the Fugitive Slave Act, which required escaped slaves to be returned to the South, their masters, etc. Slave catchers came to Northern cities to capture black slaves. Personal Liberty Laws, along with Vigilance Committees, and those were people who interfered with the capture of slaves, combined to thwart slave catchers. So basically these vigilant committees were people who would go and make it very hard for slave catchers to do their job and personal liberty laws allowed, well, law enforcement to also interfere with the slave catchers. However, this ended when the U.S. Supreme Court established that states couldn't use personal liberty laws or the U.S. Constitution to overrule the Fugitive Slave Law of 1793, which they ruled in Prigg versus Pennsylvania in 1842. That case was followed by the case of Abelman versus Booth in 1859, which itself upheld the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act against the Wisconsin Supreme Court's declaration that the law was unconstitutional. The U.S. Constitution's Supremacy Clause basically said that federal laws take precedence over state laws. Definitely established laws these days. And even back then, it made sense, but unfortunately, when it was used in this way, it resulted in a pretty bad result. So, unfortunately, that's the way it was up to 1859, according to the Supreme Court. Let's move on. Uncle Tom's Cabin. Publication of this novel in 1852 increased racial tensions. Harriet Beecher Snow of the Beecher abolitionist family wrote this book. Brutally and emotionally detailed, this book rallied many Northerners to oppose slavery and annoyed Southern slavery supporters. According to legend, Lincoln, you know, that is Abraham Lincoln, told Harriet Beecher Snow, not Snow, Stowe, Harriet Beecher Stowe, so you are the little woman who wrote this book that started this great war. And we can see a link to that right here. And I will show it to you right now. Here we go. Da, da, da. Harriet Beecher Stowe meets Lincoln. So, all right. Harriet Beecher Stowe met with President Lincoln in Washington, D.C., November 25th, 1862. And so, basically, according to the legend, as I say, so here is a little woman who wrote this book that started this great war. And there's some more interesting stuff here. Essay on the Kansas Territory, the election of 1860, and the coming of the Civil War. You can look this up. It's a pretty good thing. So let's go back to this here. Da, da, da. All right. John Brown's Raid on Harper's Ferry. In the fall of 1859, John Brown raided a federal armory at Harper's 
Ferry, Virginia, which is now in West Virginia, it pushed the north and south tensions to the breaking point, to the point of no return. Brown had many ties to famous abolitionists, including Frederick Douglass, and Brown recruited a small group of people to raid the armory and take weapons to arm the slaves. The idea was to start a huge slave rebellion and destroy slavery. Unfortunately, reinforcements led by General Robert E. Lee, who later would command the Confederate Army, defeated the raiders. Authorities captured, tried, and executed John Brown later in 1859. John Brown's Raid on Harper's Ferry. The raid was not a failure, even though Brown was executed and the rebellion failed. So you might ask, hey, wait a minute. If Brown was executed and the rebellion failed, how is it not a failure? Well, the raid did make pro-slavery people afraid that Northerners would violently oppose slavery some more. Even though most Northern politicians did not approve of the use of violence, the Southerners believed that more such violence would occur. An important note is don't describe John Brown as crazy, wild, insane, or out of control. While Brown's defense attorney pled insanity to save Brown's life, Brown was a religious zealous abolitionist, so he knew what he was doing. He wasn't crazy. He wasn't legally unable to tell the difference between right and wrong. He just said, no, I decided that slavery is a bigger evil than breaking a law that's written by man, and God is telling me to do this. So he was not somebody who would be legally insane. You know, legally insane usually is defined as somebody who cannot tell the difference between right and wrong. That person would be defined as legally insane and thus not responsible for their actions. And John Brown probably would have believed the words of Barry Goldwater from, you know, about 100 years later which are normally paraphrased as extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice, moderation in the pursuit of justice is no virtue. And we can see that here. Here's the website where I got that. And you can take a look at that. It does say these lines are generally credited to Barry Goldwater, but he didn't write them. Carl Hess. Goldwater's lovable anarchist speechwriter put them into the Senator's Republican Convention acceptance speech. So that's something that's worth considering, and we can see how these themes reflect over the years and decades in America that people will say, hey, there's nothing wrong with being an extremist if it's something that's good and necessary and it's not good to be moderate if that means you're going to do something that's not good or you're going to allow something ex to exist, a vice, something bad. You don't want to allow something bad to exist when you shouldn't. All right, hope that made sense to you. Did you find this video useful? If you did, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Neither action costs you anything and you'll be alerted about my new videos. Why? Well, it's really simple. The YouTube does not let me share any ad revenue unless I have a thousand subscribers and 4,000 hours of view time in a year. While many people are watching these, I don't have 4,000 hours of watch time in the last year. I also don't quite have a thousand subscribers at this time, although at the time of this recording, it's very close. So. Why not help me get over the top? Why do you want to help me get ad money? Well, ad money will help me make more videos. So if you find these at all helpful, hey, why not help me help you? If you saw an ad during this video, please know I did not get any of the ad money and I won't get any ad money until I have the subscribers and view time that YouTube demands. For the same reasons, you're not only welcome, but encouraged to share links to this video, put it in playlists, etc. And I do gladly read and respond to constructive criticism or suggestions for new videos. You want to tell me something? Go ahead. Leave a comment in the comment section. Email me, etc. My contact information is coming up after this. But I do reserve the right to delete comments such as troll posts or spam. You know, I realize an online connection might be cheaper than therapy, but 
please don't take out your problems on me and please don't use my use my comment section to advertise spam products okay you can hire me for tutoring if you are in the San Francisco Bay Area or somewhere near where I travel. We can meet in person. If you have an internet connection that can handle video or audio communications and you must, otherwise I don't know how you're watching this, you can hire me for tutoring online. And what I'd like to say to everyone is thanks for watching. If you would like my contact information, please keep watching. Contact me. You can contact me through Facebook at www.facebook.com forward slash Tutoring. Instagram, www.instagram.com, john.linaball.tutoring. My cell phone number is 415-623-4251. You can email me at john at johnlinaball.com, and my website is www.johnlinaball.com or www.johnlinaballtutoring.com. Doesn't matter which one you pick, it'll take you to the same website. Testpreparation.locals.com is my locals.com site. It has the same videos as this channel. Well, slightly edited because of space considerations, etc. on testpreparation.locals.com. But anyway, it's a nice thing, a lot lighter on the ads, etc. I'm also on lbry.tv at John Linneball Tutoring. And if you want to mail me something, you can reach me by mail at John Linneball Tutoring, 1859 Powell Street, number 109, San Francisco, California, 94133. Finally, please note, this is not a substitute for your classes, your text, etc. This video is based on the Barron's AP United States History Review Book, 4th edition, and any other sources listed in the video description as well as my general knowledge of U.S. history. While this should help you do well on the AP U.S. history exam, I can't be responsible for what your teacher thinks is important and asks you about on his or her own tests, homework, etc. Please read your class text or text and pay attention to what your teacher says in class if you would like to do well in that course. And with that, I'm out of here. Hope you have a good day.